Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Don Marsh. They're having a lot of fun on and around the University of Missouri-St. Louis campus this week. It's Pirates Week, activities designed to promote the weekend Umsel Opera Theater production of Gilbert and Sullivan's The Pirates of Penzance. Most of us think of Long John Silver, Captain Hook, or Jack Sparrow when it comes to pirates, but they are fictional. How about the real thing? Let's ask an expert. Each of the three weekend performances at Umzul will be preceded by a lecture on pirates by Mark Hanna, Associate Professor of History at the University of California, San Diego. He is the author of the 2015 book, Pirate Nests and the Rise of the British Empire, 1570 to 1740. He joins us by phone. Mark, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Well, you know, I have to think that... uh, Pirates, the pirates you write about, were really bad dudes, and yet we have romanticized them so. Why do you think that is? Uh, Well, actually, it's interesting. The pirates that I write about um, were, in fact, uh, bad people from our perspective. But actually, my book is about how people in colonial communities actually welcomed and supported them, surprisingly. I think that's actually probably hopefully most more surprising for readers to find that people who committed acts of piracy and the Pacific Ocean or the Indian Ocean actually arrived in places like Newport, Rhode Island and, and settled down and married local women and became sort of political players or customs collectors and no longer took to piracy anymore. So in some respects, the pirates I read about are actually more boring <laughs> than the pirates you imagine from the movies. Well, you do you do write, obviously, as you've just indicated, that they had a great influence uh, on land. And that is because they just simply at some point settled down, or did they uh, venture out from time to time to continue their piracy? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I think in reality, the vast majority of, of human history, piracy is not a vocation, uh, and it's rare for people to self-identify as, as a pirate. That's true today as it was in the 17th century. And in fact, most um, individuals who commit acts of piracy, they do so hopefully as sort of one big strike and then go home and, and no longer have to take to the sea again. There's only a handful really in human history of people who become sort of lifelong pirates and devote themselves to, to that you know that life when in fact the majority uh, would prefer to not face such dangers and such hardships and struggle for food and not have much human interaction would rather actually make money, settle down and be part of the, the, the social system and but yet at the top because they'd be financially able to do that. Who were some of the bad guys? Some of the bad guys. So the, you know, there's, a, there's an interesting period. So the first few nine chapters of my book is about how piracy was actively supported. And so a lot of the people that I write about are pretty rough, and they, they will kill and murder Spanish uh, Catholics or they'll attack Muslim pilgrimage vessels in the 1690s, and they settle down and buy land and marry local women. But uh, the book eventually tells a story about how these communities stop supporting uh, these individuals. And so they end up starting to attack their own people. And it's a strange period between roughly 1716 and 1726, when it was known as the War on Pirates, when the communities are no longer supporting them, and they re- and these pirates are attacking their own people. Uh, and that's when you get some of the most famous, infamous individuals, the most bloody and violent individuals, including Blackbeard, who is uh, a real, actual pirate, who whose ship was actually discovered off of uh, North Carolina fairly recently. Uh, a man named Edward Lowe, who used to cut off the ears of his victims and force them to eat, uh, eat them with salt and pepper. Uh, and there are a number of other, these sort of pretty vicious, violent figures that come really only in a very sm- short period of time, this little window of time. Were they independent actors at the time, or were they associated with any governments that, in, in any way? Yeah, I think the first, so my book is, is uh, it's 10 chapters long, and the first nine chapters, they're almost all supported by someone. And so they, and the question really is, who are they supported by, and what does that tell you about sort of how the big, broad history of the British Empire was, was formulated? Uh, in the early period, they could be supported by, let's say, uh, an individual uh, who's a wealthy aristocrat who might have his own sort of private navy and, and gives, you know, written documents giving permission to attack uh, various peoples. It could be someone, let's say, even a landlocked country like the Duke of Savoy might give out commissions that say you could be part of their navy and you have some permission to fight on their behalf. On the other hand, there might be someone, let's say, who is uh, a governor, let's say governor of Jamaica, who might not have permission from the King of England, but 
feels like as governor of Jamaica, they have the right to give permission and, and, and pieces of paper that essentially give permission to fight uh, what they consider enemies all during peacetime. So the, all these people are technically performing acts of piracy, but they're doing so at a time, uh, at, they're doing so with some sort of permission with some government agent on land. And, and that's actually even true today to an extent. I mean, many people who commit acts of piracy still feel like they have some sort of justification or support with some landed community, uh, even if it's outside the central authority of that primary government. Now, I want to talk about modern-day piracy in just a moment, but, but, but first, I think a lot of people have the impression that most of the pirates and piracy uh, took place in the, in, the, in the Caribbean, if you will. But if I remember history correctly, it seems to me the first couple of lines of the Marine Corps hymn from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, the Tripoli part was be, they were sent out to deal with pirates, weren't they? Yeah, so you're referring to uh, North African Corsairs, and they were essentially uh, a series of North African city-states in what's today Morocco, Libya, Algiers, Algeria, sorry, it was all called Algiers yeah. in the 17th century. Uh, and these were uh, primarily uh, Muslim city-states that sent out their own uh, captains to attack uh, Christian shipping. And, and it really began in the 16th century, uh, became a fairly... Uh, significant problem for uh, for the European states during the 17th century. Uh, but it continued into the period following the American Revolution. And right after the Revolution, when the British Navy no longer was going to protect uh, American patriot shipping, uh, North African corsairs uh, started to attack American shipping that tried to make its way in, into trade in the Mediterranean. And so that's really one of the first wars that the United States fought after the American Revolution was the first Barbary War. And how well did, how did that turn out? Uh, it turned out in the end they had to go, they had to be two of them: uh, the first Barbary War followed by the second Barbary War. Uh, and in the end, with the help of other nations, uh, they succeeded in ending the sort of scourge of Barbary corsairing in the Mediterranean. And it really freed a it freed the, um, the United States to trade in the Mediterranean. And b it also was one of the first wars in American history following the revolution that really united what had been disparate colonies into what is today the United States. What were the pirates, in general, the pirates after? Uh, well, they were after commodities of all sorts. Um, typically, it depends on where they were going. Uh, there is a number, in my book, I write about a, a number of very specific commodities. In the 17th century, pirates often were attacking slave ships. And they were stealing slaves to sell to uh, colonies where slaves were more difficult to obtain, the places like South Carolina or, let's say, Virginia. They also were attacking Spanish ships that were taking large amounts of silver uh, out of uh, New Spain, what is today um, Potosi, one of the great silver mines, uh, and Zacatecas, uh, and today Mexico. They were attacking those, and then many sh uh, pirates by the 1690s started sailing into the Indian Ocean and they began to attack pilgrimage vessels that were heading to Mecca and Jeddah. And those vessels often had silk, uh, calico, uh, and Arabian gold, uh, as well as other sort of very expensive commodities. That, that kind of new to me, the, what you mentioned with regard to attacking slave ships uh, for, for the slaves. That must have been awful, awful for the, for the slaves. I mean, it was bad enough as it was, but to have you know, a, a potential battle being fought over them uh, on the seas. Yeah, I mean, actually, a lot of people, few people know that the first slaves to arrive in Bermuda and Jamestown were brought in by pirates who had stolen them from the Portuguese. Uh, and so, yeah, this is to make, to make uh, matters uh, worse than they were before. Uh, one thing that's interesting about um, slave ships is that uh, in a later period when uh, pirates attacked slave ships and, and made uh, slaves part of the, their crews, when they were brought to trial, the slaves were actually found not guilty because they'd was perceived that they didn't have a choice to be in that situation in the first place. What, uh, you know, we have this, uh, thanks to Walt Disney and others, we have this uh, perception of what pirates look like. I mean, we, we, we see them with parrots on their shoulder and knives in their, in their teeth and uh, all sorts of different things that, uh, you know, pictures of people walking the plank. Any of that stuff uh, true to life? Yeah, a lot of it is true and a lot of it isn't true. The, the walking the plank, uh, you know, doesn't really exist. There's a reference to someone doing that in the 19th century, a Spanish captain, but it is not a thing that really happens. Um, you know, keeping animals as pets 
would have been pr pretty common. In fact, um, William Dampier, a man who had committed acts of piracy, but then later on went on to publish his own sort of life story, described uh, pirates keeping animals as pets. Of course, if you're on a what you thought was going to be a three-week cruise that turned out to be a six-week cruise, that uh, that animal is not going to last very long and would quickly become food. But that's pretty common. Things like missing limbs. If that's you know in a in a rough life at sea, if you are injured in your leg or your arm, um, typical surgeon's tools in the 17th century consist of saws. So you're not going to keep that, that that appendage very long. So it's pretty common to be missing arms and legs. Uh, and even things like captains with frilly clothing is actually there's some truth to it in the large in the sense that a captain of a pirate ship would have not had the same social hierarchy that a captain of a royal navy ship would have been able to to maintain to control control his crew and so stealing the fancy clothes of uh, from another ship would have given that captain a sense of power and authority at least visually uh, and so there definitely was an interest for captains to steal the, the better clothing that they could on a, on a ship that they attacked. Did, did pirates ever attack each other? Is, was this something that may or may not have been commonplace? And, and what about mutinies on pirate ships? Well, most, well first, most uh, piracy actually begins with mutinies in a lot of ways. If You can imagine if the captain is treating his crew terribly or poorly feeding them that they're angry and rise up. If, once you've committed a mutiny, that there's not much you can do because you can't show up in a port without facing trial. So often uh, crews turn to piracy once they realize they don't have much of a choice. And there are, of course, many times when there are mutinies within pirate ships, and typically over disagreements over money, uh, booty. Uh, in fact, the most important person on a pirate ship was not the captain. It was the quartermaster who was in charge of provisioning ships and div dividing out um, captive prizes. And so that person had a very difficult job of having to sort of mete out um, uh, money and goods and do it as fairly as possible. So there certainly were divisions and, and of course, fights between pirates, like not likely to lead to, you know, cannon blasts against each other, but there definitely were mutinies and splits and between groups. You, your book uh, begins in the 1500s. Um, is that when the first pirates that we know of really came about, or would have started perhaps so much earlier with, with different kinds of groups, like the Vikings, for instance? Yeah, piracy, you know, begins as soon as people get on boats. Yeah. Uh, and, and so it's very early. In fact, piracy is a driving characteristic of ancient Greece and Rome, and, and, and you know, many of the ancient scholars write about piracy. And in fact, dealing with piracy in the Mediterranean was a really key uh, part of Pompey's uh, regime uh, under the Roman Empire. So it's an early period. I, I happen to start in that period because I'm I'm particularly focused on my own work on the rise of the British Empire and that the early period of the British Empire. And really, Britain doesn't British people don't really think of themselves as having an empire until roughly the later period of Elizabeth the first reign. And that's when people began to sail around the world from Britain and, and like Sir Francis Drake. And so it's an initial period of really imagining what, what they could be doing for the first time is something that looks like an empire. So that's why I started in that period. What other misconceptions do you think that people uh, would have today about about piracy in, in this area and since? Yeah, I, I think, you know, one of the things that's interesting, I think that uh, a lot of historians typically um, think of pirates as being somehow outside of society in the sense that they're in rebellion and, and fighting against everything in the past that people thought of as terrible, let's say social hierarchies or, or what you would even imagine as the early capitalism. And the pirates that I write about are actually are not that way at all. They're actually really interested in getting being part of that whole system, that they want to steal from someone, be successful, uh, and then become part of you know this hierarchical social world that they see on land that they can then benefit from. So I think the sort of that sort of, in fact, the people that I consider the most politically radical tended to be the people who were actively supporting the pirates, and they did so against the wishes of their own crown and king. And so that sort of political radicalism really I see as existing, but it's actually existing among Quakers in Pennsylvania, and less so much swashbuckling pirates in the Caribbean. Where was most of the piracy taking place? Was it in, in the Caribbean? Was it in the Mediterranean? Was it in the Indian Ocean, or just all of the above? It's all of the above, but the, but the idea of piracy being in the Caribbean is not a remotely a stereotype. I mean, the Caribbean, uh, 
if you were to look at a map and imagine just how shipping actually moves to the Caribbean, almost uh, most major uh, goods have to do, uh, essentially float through the Florida Channel between the Bahamas and Florida. So if you think of all the silver of the New World, just millions and millions and millions of pesos worth of silver, has to pass through very specific channels. And so it makes logical sense that the Caribbean would be a place uh, where people would focus on, on their plunder. It's also a place where lots of different nations are, are leading and competing with each other. And they all, you know, even the Danes lived, were in St. Thomas, and uh, there were Germans in the Caribbean. And so you had all these different ethnic groups fighting and combating with each other in that particular region over each island. And so it makes sense that you would have much more of this sort of lawless maritime behavior in that area. Do you think there is a, the likelihood that there's a lot of buried treasure out there as a result of uh, this activity in the Caribbean? Uh, I think there's very little buried treasure. Uh, in <laughs> fact, there's, uh, buried treasure uh, actually comes from the myth of Captain Kidd, who when he was, before he, he showed up in Boston when he, he feared that he might be accused of piracy, he allegedly uh, dropped some of his, his booty off uh, on Gardner's Island, just north of Long Island. And that, from then on, became the legend of buried treasure, and it became a mythic thing that sort of never disappeared. So there isn't a lot of buried treasure. I don't know a lot of pirates who actually literally buried their treasure, but there is a lot of treasure under the water. Um, and because of ships that were scuttled or ships that sank uh, through storms, and you know, ma- marine archaeology is a very can be a very expensive thing to do, but also could be a potentially very profitable thing uh, to do. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about modern day piracy. We've all been hearing in recent years about the uh, Somali pirates. Uh, what what do you make of all of that? You know, I, I, a lot of the, what I write about in my book, which is the reason why communities on land supported pirates and had to do with economic disparities, legal structures that are very undefined and informal, political regimes that are very local as opposed to being centralized. Um, a lot of those same processes and systems that I see that happened in the 17th century happen in any place that supports piracy, and that's true of Somalia even today. You know, very some, It does not happen in all of Somalia. It happens in Puntland, a very specific area. It happens in a very local context. And really, it has decreased dramatically, in large part because the people on land that once supported it stopped doing it. And so it ended up fitting a lot of the model of what I was writing about in the early 18th century. And so it's, it's very true that, uh, and again, just like early modern pirates, modern pirates don't call themselves pirates. Right? They imagine themselves as a Coast Guard or some sort of uh, liberation army or something like that. So it's very true today um, that piracy is not, that individuals who are committing acts of piracy still don't perceive of themselves as pirates in that sense. Nonetheless, they, they act pr- pretty much the same as their counterparts of a few centuries ago, stalking ships and uh, boarding them and taking whatever they can find. Yeah, absolutely. But then taking those goods back to a welcoming community that, that would then give them the, the gas they need to, to keep running the, the ship. They allow them to fence their booty on land. And so that whole system of sea and land that's still, that was a structure that I write about is, is still very much true today as it was back then. Okay. Can, can you clarify for me? You said that this has kind of stopped all of a sudden because they are they are no longer welcome. That surprises me because what they brought back was in this impoverished part of the world was uh, so, so desired. That's true, uh, but the individuals who are committing acts of piracy weren't really the ones profiting in the end. And this is typical of any criminal organization where the people on the front lines are not the ones necessarily making all the money. Uh, a lot of the money that went into Somalia goes in towards um, essentially this sort of this drug that uh, this sort of narcotic that a lot of the pirates would chew on to prevent them from getting seasickness. And so they would pay that money. They would have to pay off the people who supplied the ship and paid for the gas and gave them their weapons. And so like many criminal organizations, those people aren't necessarily making all the money. And then there's a lot of incentive for individuals on land to uh, uh, cut deals with the centralized government to, to sort of stop their active support. And then there are also, you know, it is true that there also has been a much more active presence of various navies in the area, including the United States, but the, probably the more aggressive and um, less restrained have been the Russians and Chinese, uh, who tend to be more open about um, shooting these individuals out of the water. Weren't the Somali pirates uh, more interested in just seizing the ship and holding the ship for ransom as opposed to plunder? Yes, that's actually true. Uh, the majority of what they were, a majority of their attacks, at least so, you know, roughly 
2009 up, up to more like 2015, they were typically hijacking and holding people for ransom, and um, and you know they were stealing huge tankers and and ships that had at one point had tanks, actual tanks on it. So they weren't taking those ships and, and you know and thinking that they were going to resell them. They were just doing it to hold them uh, ransom. It, it's really hard to believe that it, that a small boat, and I guess m- maybe it's a misconception on my part that these Somali pirates worked out of small boats and taking on these big tankers and these huge vessels. I mean, that real, really hard to overcome a crew on a big ship like that. I would think. Yeah, I show if you there's some movies out now that they finally have been doing documentaries on how these these pirates operate and. You almost have to watch one of these documentaries to be able to perceive it because it's hard for me even to describe because they have these ladders and I mean it's it, 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 it's as if you're scaling a you know a three story building and it is yeah. remarkable to imagine and doing it while floating it's actually a pretty remarkable thing to even imagine doing. And, and how many men would it take to overcome a tanker like that? <laughs> My understanding is that it wouldn't necessarily have to be a, a large group. It could just be like you know, five or six guys. And, you know, these, these tankers don't have, are not manned by very large crews. Um, they can have, so even a super tanker doesn't have to have a very large crew because so much is done by computers. So that they're not, you're not overcoming a, a crew of 100 men on board a large ship. You're, you're overcoming a crew of, you know, 20. And, and they're not armed, I'm assuming. Yeah. At least perhaps, uh, maybe they are now, but they weren't uh, when all of this got started. Yeah, it hasn't been, <clears throat> generally it, it, it it's, it's understood among sort of the modern seafaring community to not arm people for a lot of reasons. Um, but it is true that a lot of major companies started uh, hiring private maritime protection security organizations. Uh, and some were hiring, you know, for example, um, Sikhs and other groups who are more experienced in, in doing this, particularly in the Indian Ocean. So some some are armed now that they hadn't been before, but... Um, you know, I think still to this day, most are not are not armed, just for safety purposes, safety yeah. reasons. A few years ago, I read a book called The Deep, and I think it was written by Peter Benchley, the fellow who wrote Jaws. Are you familiar with that by any chance? No, I'm not, but I've seen, I think the same person who wrote that wrote a book called The Island, um, which be. is a movie uh, about, it was a movie about, pi- maybe it's the same, it's the same story, uh, maybe it came from The Deep, but it was a movie of, of about pirates who never left an island in the Caribbean? And not quite. It's about pirates in the Caribbean who um, would uh, overtake yachts, luxury yachts, you know, and uh, board them and uh, sometimes kill the people on board, sometimes steal their jewelry, their money, what have you. Uh, and it was considered a modern-day version of piracy. Uh, is any of that stuff going on? It, it It is going on. In fact, sadly enough, there was a couple from San Diego, where I'm from, um, that were killed by Somali pirates not that long ago, maybe about um, maybe about six years ago. Uh, and still quite dangerous. I know there was a family that had been attacked in I think in um, I think in the the Orinoco Basin in, in the Caribbean. And so it is uh, it is you know there's still certain places around the world where it's quite dangerous to be you know in a smaller yacht. Um, so I, I don't mean to make people nervous but, it, but no, well. you, know, you can you can actually you can read a lot of this yourself there's the international chamber of commerce uh if you went online actually has a live piracy map that every time piracy is reported around the world you can actually see it and actually get specific details so it's not so much a mystery you can actually go online it's called it's the international chamber of commerce uh and you can look it up a couple of quick questions for you as our time begins to wind down were there ever any female pirates yeah, there are a number of female pirates. There's some very famous Chinese female pirates. The most the most famous female pirates in American sort of popular culture are Anne Bonny and Mary Reed. Uh, they're very much real. They uh, were actually captured and, and brought to trial in Jamaica in 1721. Uh, and we <clears throat> have a trial record that describes their actions. We have some witness accounts. We have newspaper accounts. And they both pled their bellies, which me- actually means to claim to be pregnant, which is to avoid execution. Um, but it doesn't look like they were successful in, in allowing that to happen. They didn't fool around in those days, did they? No. What, what about the Jolly Roger, the uh, skull and crossbones on a black field? Yeah, so uh, you, during most of the period that I read about, which is the late uh, 16th, early 17th century, uh, mid-17th century, that most pirates, 
um, were sailed either their own flag, they were proud of where they were from, or they would fly, they would fly a fake flag just to trick the, the, the ship they're trying to approach. But they didn't perceive themselves as pirates. They perceived themselves as essentially part of their own ethnic heritage and were fighting what they thought of as, as specific enemies. And so they weren't flying any sort of distinct flag. But that does happen. Uh, roughly after 1704, when the beginning of this period, which is called the War on Pirates, and when, when these individuals start attacking their own people, they do, in fact, start flying their own flags, uh, and they're very unique. They're not all the simple Jolly Roger of the skeleton head and the two crossbones, but in fact could be all sorts of different shapes with a skeleton with a wine glass in his hand or a skeleton with a dart that goes through a heart. And there's the most interesting I've ever seen was, I think, Bartholomew Roberts, who had a flag with two skeletons, and they are both standing on, uh, standing on a skull, uh, and below it, it said A B uh, H, and the other one said uh, A uh, M H, and that meant our Barbadian's head, and the other one meant a Martinican's head, and it meant that I hate people from Barbados and I hate people from Martinique because they killed my former crew, and I will always attack those people and murder them whenever I have the chance. So it was a very unique message to send out to uh, uh, those who might cross their path. Well, as we said at the beginning of this conversation, Mark Hanna, there are a lot of bad dudes, a lot of bad dudes out there for a long, long time. Right. Again, let me thank you, and I'm sure a lot of folks will uh, be enjoy, enjoying listening to you uh, before the performances of the Pirates of Penzance at uh, Umsel this weekend. Uh, you're in town now, right? I am. Well, good. Enjoy your time in St. Louis, and thank you so much uh, for being with us. Thank you for having me. Archived versions of past St. Louis on the Air programs are available for download or podcast at stlpublicradio.org slash stlonair. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. Thank you for listening. I'm Don Marsh. Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com.